Hey, did you already start? I am. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm really excited that you're here and that you agreed to take some time to sit down and chat with me. Um, let's start by, could you please introduce yourself with your name and your pronouns? I am AC Goldberg. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm a speech language pathologist. Awesome. I can't wait to get your perspective. Um, could you tell us a little more about your educational background and how many years you've been doing this work? Sure. I've been in SLP for 20 years. Um, I got a master's. Um, actually, that's not true. I've been in SLP for 18 years, almost 20 years. <laughs> um, I got, um, I did my undergraduate work in New York and then moved up to the Boston area um, for my master's. And then I studied for a doctorate um, in the UK. Um, and I have been working primarily with um, children and adolescents, but I also work doing um, some niche communication with adults and gender voice modification as well. Um, so I've got my toe in a lot of different communities within the SLP um, treat re treatment realm. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like working with people who have more complex needs or things that are more niche um, that might be overlooked or microaggressed upon by other people. Um, mm -hmm. So I can help affirm everyone in you know, their ability, their neurotype, their gender, um, regardless of who they are or why they're seeking services um, related to speech and language. I really love how you mentioned that that providing of affirming care because that by itself can be so influential in the outcomes of, of our patients. Um, I would love to know a little bit more. I, I'm sorry, I forgot how you worded it. Was it gender mod? What did you call it? Uh, for I call it gender voice modification. Gender voice. People call it gender affirming voice. It's it's okay. Okay. Um, you can call it anything that makes sense for you. Um, the reason I call it gender voice modification, and I'll kind of parse this out a little bit is because, you know, yes, of course it's affirming, but everything I do is affirming. Um, and gender voice modification stands out to me because I think that very oftentimes cisgender people seek out my services for their voice um, and it doesn't match their gender. You know, it's, it's sometimes, um, you know, people whose systems produce estrogen as they're getting older, they produce less estrogen and their, their pitch drops, they feel uncomfortable. Um, sometimes you've got, you know, someone who's masculine presenting who's really small um, and has sort of like a, a voice that they perceive to not fit with their overall persona. And a lot of these people are cisgender, not, not all. And the majority of my um, gender voice modification clients are transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming fall under that umbrella. But some people are cisgender and I think that they would probably not love the term gender affirming um, because that might undermine the fact that they feel that their genders don't need to be affirmed. Um, however, um, because everything that I do is affirming, I can just consider it modification. And it can be for anyone of any gender, really. You want to modify your voice, I can help. That is interesting. I didn't consider, um, like you mentioned, maybe later in life as, as hormone levels change or what have you, how it could be applicable to cisgender folks as well. Um, so that's, that's really interesting background. I would love to know a little more about um, how and where and when you learned specifically about providing um, I, I heard you say that all the care you provide is gender affirming, but specifically this voice modification for folks to affirm their gender um, for queer and trans folks. Was that something that you learned about in your initial studies or did you have to, yeah, where did you get that information? Um, so I, um, I've been involved over the years um, taking, you know, graduate student interns from a number of universities. Um, and one of them is Emerson College that I'll just give a shout out to Emerson and my voice mentor, Barb Worth, who is incredible. Um, I was providing some clinical supervision and, you know, as a, as a trans person, I felt very uncomfortable in graduate school. I felt like I had to fit into a certain mold. Nobody at my graduate program was terrible to me about my gender. They, they just weren't, they didn't understand it. Um, but the program overall, you know, it, there was no such thing, no such service offered. You know, th there was no mention of it. There was no discussion about trans anything. There was no discussion about pronouns. Um, you know, I was sort of to them part of like a fringe community. I went to Boston University for my master's and they've come a, a, like a long way. I mean, obviously they, they've got their own, they've got their own center where they're studying things there. And um, that's all wonderful. But when I was providing some clinical supervision at Emerson, 
I got in touch with Barb and this is maybe 10 years ago. And I had finally started becoming more comfortable with my own voice at that point. Um, and as someone who had been um, heavily influenced by music and singing um, in sort of my teens and twenties, I felt really early twenties, felt really uncomfortable when um, outwardly I changed my gender presentation to more align with how I am and who I am, but my singing voice and my overall voice didn't change along with it. And I connected with Barb who was providing these services and was just sort of starting a clinic at Emerson. And um, she really, really brought me in um, and was like, you know, here's, here's how to, you know, we've been doing this work for years. It's not very well known. It's not very well studied and now it is. Um, but she really brought me in and, you know, helped me understand what's involved in, in giving those types of services when I was someone who had never experienced competent clinical interactions, watching someone else, a cisgender provider, go in and do that and realizing, oh my gosh, like I can do this. You know, this is, she's, she's a great clinician and, and she's wonderful. And I already had all the tools I needed. All I really needed, I needed some brush up on technical voice stuff, which she helped me with. But all I really needed was to just see the fact that it could happen, that you could have a, a react, an interaction with, um, with a clinician that wasn't traumatic because I had never ever experienced like intake procedures that weren't traumatic, clinical interactions that weren't traumatic. So just seeing it was what kind of sparked it in me. And so over the years we've collaborated on a lot of projects and um, I, you know, really credit her with helping me see that this was a thing um, and, you know, always working to center me and my voice and other trans people in their work, um, very much like Sandy Hirsch um, does out in, in your area, um, you know, trying to um, provide the service and also um, give um, trans and gender non-conforming people a voice in, in that, um, you know, it's really this work is so personal and meaningful to us. Um, you know, our voices, they're our instrument and very oftentimes they're our tell. You know, they're, they're what makes you unsafe in a situation. Um, you know, a lot of the times when I'm working with people, they don't necessarily wanna change the sound of their voice. They just want a safety set so that they can talk to the Uber person over the phone and then meet the Uber. So they can, you know, talk to a store clerk so that they can, you know, um, have interactions with people who they don't know and not fear violence. Um, you know, so it's, it's, I feel like it's very important work, but maybe that's just me. I, so much of what you said just gave me chills. Like first the, the concept of realizing that you can have a clinical interaction with a provider and not have it be traumatic and how, how heartbreaking it is that for so many queer and trans people that isn't mirrored to them sometimes ever, or for a long time. Um, and how that important that representation is of seeing someone do the work and how maybe the technicalities of it aren't actually that different from stuff you're already trained on. It's just how you implement it. And, and I didn't even consider how, um, yeah, the, the concept of folks like, um, I'm not sure if how you feel about the term passing. I know that folks sometimes still use it, others um, find it like offensive, um, but how that can be their tell as you put it and how the safety um, the influences of safety behind it and how truly life-saving your work can be um, for folks to be able to to feel safe. The safety element is huge. Yeah, I mean, the term passing is really loaded. I, I call, I say cis-assumed now, mm -hmm. um, you know, like just because I'm cis-assumed because passing, you know, it's, passing is what? You know, it's, it, I mean, I know that you understand that, but, you know, I, for people who are listening who don't understand, passing means, you know, sort of what, some trans people and a lot of cis people believe to be the goal of transition, which is to, you know, look like a gender that wasn't the, aligned with the sex that you were assigned at birth. But that's really very rarely anyone's goal. But being able to make sure that you can code switch into that for a lot of people is not only a goal, but a, a vital measure in keeping them safe. Um, and, you know, that's, a lot of the reasons why, you know, um, trans and gender non-conforming people um, go to the great lengths that they do to, you know, 
disguise their their you know the, their body shape, um, their voice, um, just other elements of their presentation is not always for them. Um, very often, it's it's for it's for safety. I mean, not always because of the way that they feel internally, but the way that the pe the way that people treat them. I'm one of those people who never had gender dysphoria. Um, but felt compelled because I, the, of the way I was being treated um, to start taking hormones because um, I wasn't taken seriously in any spaces. Um, I looked 18 years old until I was, you know, 38 and now I'm 41 and people finally give me a little bit of space. Um, and now I feel like I have to be conscientious of how much space I do take up because I am a cis assumed white able body passing sometimes unless I'm using a mobility aid person and you know I, that carries a lot of privilege and as someone who's come from a place where I have seen what it's like to not have that privilege to have the privilege now is it's an it's an unbelievable realization of how much privilege it is just to present as male and white in our society. And I don't wanna get us too far off topic, but I mean, that's a serious consideration for a lot of people. Absolutely. And you're so right. I've, I've certainly had patients who, it wasn't until they felt, um, they felt that they had um, better support, both from their clinical providers and from other folks that they felt comfortable. Um, they, they described it to me as like relaxing into, yes, I'm trans, but I can present in this sort of non-binary way that feels more authentic to me as opposed to having to fit this particular mold. Um, and I, I love, thank you for sharing that, Sis Assumed. I love that. Um, I think that's a fantastic way to word it. Um, so I will make mental note. Uh, so thank you. I want to backtrack for a second because so much of what you said, I can certainly resonate with as a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, with this concept of like, oh, this exists or this can exist and I can do this um, because so many folks uh, don't know that public floor physical therapy is a thing. Um, and when I was in school, I went to school in Texas, there were only three certified, um, I believe they still call it, unfortunately, women's um, health certified as opposed to just public health because um, everyone has a pelvis, but there were only three um, women's health certified in all, all of Texas. I know, right? <laughs> Um, and, and it's really interesting to see how it's ballooning and, and more people are getting interested in it. But even then, sorry, I think there's a motorcycle outside. Um, when I was, when I was learning about it, all the emphasis was on pregnant cis women, um, and no, literally no mention of someone like post-op vaginoplasty or something, which has so many implications for the pelvic floor and how now it's becoming more researched and, and more well-known, um, but it wasn't until like you get that exposure of, oh, I can use these skills that I'm learning and apply it to this population that I'm passionate about and that has um, that is so underserved uh, and really be, um, be impactful there. So my question is, do you feel that since the 10 years ago when you had your mentor, um, do you feel that more and more speech paths are starting to do the work that you're doing and is becoming less of a niche and more or, or not really? It's interesting. I have a lot of mixed feelings about it um, because there are so many queer, trans, and gender nonconforming SLPs who are passed over for positions in voice clinics. Um, in fact, you know, I was just recently applying for jobs and I was passed over for things that I was highly qualified to do um, in trans voice clinics. Um, and, you know, I've yet to see who they hired, but the general trend seems to be you know, um, a vocalist, um, a cis female vocalist who's, you know, adorable and bubbly and they think will work well with the team. Um, and the problem is that cis people are still the primary providers of trans care. Um, you know, you've seen these online shops pop up like Plume and Folks Health. I can't tell you how excited I am about that. Like, I, you know, it is, the essence of transphobia and gatekeeping that transgender people, not, not in this situation at all, but that transgender people need to kind of go through this gauntlet of proving their transness to cisgender people in order to access services. And we're all dying to have trans clinicians, I mean, or people who are culturally responsive. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very important to see that those spaces are popping up and to see that more and more people are inviting in trans and queer people into their practices, saying like, oh, you know, we serve this population, 
maybe, you know, we should all be trained, but maybe we should also have someone who just in case someone has so much trauma that they don't want to see a cisgender person, I think we should also have someone on staff who, you know, has lived experience, you know, that this person could feel comfortable with. And I'm seeing more and more of that now, um, you know, and that has really shifted. Um, my, my mixed feelings about people doing gender affirming uh, voice care in the speech, speech and language is that I think half of them genuinely, not more than half, I would say 90% of them or more, genuinely, genuinely care um, and want to provide compassionate services from a culturally responsive lens that are affirming, that help their client reach a goal, and a small sliver of them want to just seem woke. And there's always an element of feeling tokenized when someone wants to study you and they're not you. <laughs> um, however, I think the fact that this is becoming more mainstream in my profession is a tremendous tribute to people like Sandy Hirsch, Aaron Ziegler, uh, Leah Halu, um, and Christy Block, and all these people who have really put it out there as this is something we can do as professionals. Um, and they've made it accessible. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And I don't like the virtue signalers, but I think there are relatively few of those. Um, and I, you know, I don't love feeling like a niche that someone can study. Um, I think like that feels, it does feel tokenizing, um, but at the same time, it's extremely important that we're studying um, what we're doing. So you know, there, there's there's a fine line um, that I think all of us feel um, within the within the community of you know having cisgender people sort of treat us and study us, um, but we also understand that it's really essential to move things forward. And if you look at the bottleneck of research going through the W path, I mean, it takes eight years to get something peer reviewed. Right now, it's pretty terrible. Um, the research bottleneck is, is tremendous and all of the studies that are coming out now are from 2016. I mean, you know, things need to get moved along and more queer and trans people need to make, be able to have academia accessible to them so that they can be doing the research, but we're not, but you know, the, the chain hasn't caught up to that, to that point yet. Um, but in general, we are very glad to see more affirming providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I remember being in grad school and being like, where, where is the research talking about trans specific folks, specifically as it relates to um, musculoskeletal issues? Uh, because right now, yeah, everything, and I'm sure it's similar in your profession has to be extrapolated from, from cis folks, um, which is not, not the most helpful from a clinical decision-making standpoint, but also, yeah, how do you not, not um, cause that feeling of tokenization for the participants or clients or patients that are trans who, who are being studied, as you said. And also, how do you not realize going back that all of that research and the gender and sex research that has been done on those populations is flawed because there's trans people in there. Mm, that's there's great. trans women lumped in with the men being studied in those studies. There, there's non-binary people in, in the whole thing. There's trans men being lumped in with the women in those studies. So when you actually look at things, just like language norms, when you look at things, there's usually like a, you know, the 25% on the edge and the 50% in the middle that fall into a range of, you know, sort of typical function of whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, even if it's an anatomically specific thing, you know, um, if you're talking about something that, you know, um, well, I, I could get I could get really deep into this, um, but you know, research is all biased in that they make people choose a binary sex designation when that doesn't. It's oftentimes not their gender or not their sex assigned at birth. Um, so none of the data that we have on anything at all is normed appropriately according to sex or gender. I had never considered that before, but it, I can definitely see that that is so true. And then even if you were to um, to study trans folks specifically, no trans person is the same. There's so many ways someone can be trans, right? Not undergoing any medical transition, going all the way through all the hormones and many surgeries. There's just so many ways that someone can be trans. So well, when you factor in intersex people, I also happen to be yeah. intersex. When you factor in intersex people, like we don't fall cleanly kind of anywhere in there. And that's never asked about on, you know, on a survey. 
um you know you can ask someone sex assigned at birth but you never hear like well are you intersex because you're not usually assigned intersex at birth usually it's either not designated or they choose for you and they give you a mutilating surgery and then you live the rest of your life according to what a doctor called you when you came out right. um you know it's it's rough for intersex it, absolutely especially. yeah intersex folks are overlooked incredibly it's another thing that is not even mentioned in public floor education which is bonkers to me because there's so many so many implications for that um but I would love to, to learn a little more about your like day-to-day -day in terms of clinical practices or services you provide. Um, yeah, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Um, well, I am going back to being a school SLP. Um, so I'll be working with adolescents. Um, I just kind of took a little leave from that. Um, I'll be going back to working with adolescents, um, many of whom are autistic. Um, I think the vast majority of whom are autistic. Um, and just kind of working with them on their, I like to really work on holistic functional language. Um, you know, some people that I work with use devices, some people that I work with are verbal communicators, um, and, you know, some people are non-speaking um, and they communicate differently. And what I really like to do is help people feel comfortable communicating the way that they communicate, the way that they choose in any setting. Um, and I really like to make things as accessible and comfortable as possible. Um, I don't sort of like put, um, unless they want privacy and discussion in an office, I don't put myself in an office. We go out into the community. We, I mean, depending on COVID um, right now, um, guidelines, you know, we go out and we do things, we have interactions um, in the real world. We see what it's like to use language, you know, in all places, not just kind of, you know, at a certain point, a school, a classroom, and an office, they disappear from your life. And you have to be able to, you know, navigate asking, you know, is this the right bus? Um, how much does this cost? Um, you know, I have to keep my hat on like this. It's too bright in here, even though somebody told me to remove it. I mean, you have to navigate sort of all of those nuanced interactions. Um, and for me, um, the more nuanced, the more interesting. And then usually after work, I've got a couple hours where I see some voice clients or provide some clinical supervision at a university. Um, then I pick up my own kids. And in the evenings, I give cultural responsiveness trainings on my platform, which is called Transplaining. Um, and you know, generally there, um, I do consulting work um, and I teach sort of modules on gender inclusion, but I also host intersectional guests where, you know, people can talk about things like, you know, racism in public school settings and what you can do to disrupt it and, you know, dialect and assessment and how that impacts, you know, speech language pathologist practice, um, all sorts of things that, you know, are um, extremely important, how to be, you know, affirming of all neurotypes. Um, and that's my day to day. I, I, I work a lot. Yeah, it sounds like it. You're certainly leading by example. You are certainly doing all the work, it seems. You're very busy. Um, my next question was about how your passion for inclusivity um, impacts your work, but I, I feel like that's just bowling up in every answer um, you're giving so far. So if it's okay with you, we might just jump to the next oh, one. Oh yeah, everyone is welcome in my <laughs> space at all times to be themselves because that's what I think is most important, uh, you know, is to feel comfortable as who you are and not to be told by someone else that you can't be that way because I have been harmed by that so much. Um, but we can totally move on to the next question. <laughs> I know you get that from me. Yeah, I, I, I love it though. It's, it's very apparent how, how passionate you are for this. Um, so what are some unique needs clinically that um, are important when serving queer and trans folks in the speech therapy specific space? So um, you are by no means expected to teach us how to be um, speech traps in this interview. It's just we're given very little background on um, SLPs and what they do, and most of it's related to stroke care, right? We don't learn a lot about other other things that y'all can provide other than like barium swallow studies. So if you have any specific clinical pearls to share with us, that'd be great. So in general, you know, a speech language pathologist, um, I mean, we can really help PTs, um, you know, I, I related to stroke care and things, especially if you've got someone who, you know, has lost their ability to speak um, and just coming up with, you know, a communication system because somebody needs to be able to give you consent to move their body, you know, when you're yelling, you know, um, Bob, if it's okay with you, I'm going to move your leg. Okay. I hope it's okay with you. And, you know, um, you don't know how to get their consent. You know, a speech pathologist can really help you develop a system with someone um, where they can consent to being touched or moved. 
um, you know, that's, that's a way that we collaborate. I mean, but we can also, you know, do things like co-treatment where, you know, you're um, helping someone move and the speech pathologist giving them the language um, around it, which I assume a lot of PTs do give the language around, you know, that, but speech language pathologists, um, you know, have other ways of helping people access language um, while they're doing activities um, that can kind of trigger um, easier word retrieval. But I'm talking, I started talking about strokes because you started talking about strokes. Um, you know, in general, um, so if you're talking about voice specifics, um, you know, we're really, we're really kind of from, you know, we're, we're head and neck up. Um, we're, well, obviously respiratory system. Um, and then, you know, head and neck up. So any speech language pathologist probably has about the same working knowledge uh, as any PT who is specialized in, you know, respiratory care, um, anything that has to do with head and neck cancer, anything that has to do with the brain. Um, so, you know, we kind of have that, we have that clinical overlap in that we understand, you know, all of the, all of the innervation and all of the, you know, the way that the muscles work together um, and the way that cognitively things function. Um, and that's sort of our domain. But in terms of um, like voice specific care, um, we, you know, understand laryngeal function, um, which I don't know if that's covered in PT school. Um, at all, we um, we understand laryngeal function um, and the ways in which the larynx can be impacted by sort of various things like intubation, which could be a consideration for any of you know if any of your folks who have sort of come through surgery come to you afterwards and are like I don't know what's going on with my voice, send them to an SLP because like they could have you know unilateral vocal fold paralysis from you know an extubation injury that's really common. Um, is that it's, it's really common to, to injure the cords on the way in and on the way out, but usually on the way out. Um, oftentimes if people pull out their own, their own tube, which happens a lot, I mean, you know, um, the vocal fold injury um, is pretty common with intubations. Um, and that's one of those things that if you've seen a client and then they've been intubated and you see them again and something's going on with their voice, have them go get checked out. Um, that's, I have so many more um, little, little clinical uh, knowledge nuggets, but, um, you know, the whole, um, we have so much more crossover in our scope um, than, you know, what I can boil down to in sort of a, a quick response. But I think that things for you all to know about and to look for in terms of speech or language, you know, if you're working with someone, and I'm not talking necessarily just about trans people, um, but, you know, is keep an eye out for their, for voice injury. You know, if you're working with someone who has a cervical spine injury, and they complain to you that they cough every time they eat. They probably have dysphagia and they probably need to go see an SLP for an MBS. I know about this because I had that and was not taken seriously by a doctor um, who told me it was because I was trying to alter my voice and I wasn't at the time, I just looked trans. Um, and you know, I was unable to ever get an answer and I must've had bronchitis 50 times before I got spine surgery and that resolved itself. And I was like, that was dysphagia. And everyone was just acting like I was making it up. Um, you know, that um, those sorts of things do come up where um, the lesser known SLP stuff um, slips past like dysphagia because of um, cervical spine injury. Um, what else? I think that's a lot of great practical stuff to. Uh, I'm like, I lost my train of thought because there's so many things that I could say. Well, if, if anything comes up, you're more than welcome to interrupt me, but those are all really great practical examples. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really horrible. I'm so sorry that you were not taken seriously and that you had to go through that. That's awful. Well, I will tell you with, you know, complete honesty in this call that, you know, I told you I had never seen someone who was affirming um, and had a lot of trauma from clinical experience, from clinical interactions. Um, I have EDS, which is um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and I'm sure that you know what it is because you're a PT and anyone who watches this is going to be a PT. Um, I was told consistently that my, my injuries were related to me trying too hard to be masculine, mm -hmm. and I'm not very masculine. Like, I, you know, I know how I present, but like, I'm not someone who's like, I'm going to go lift. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not, you know, I, I've kept myself in decent shape, but like, I'm not going to 
be someone who is like trying really hard at a gym and you know things like tearing my acl which just happened because i tripped tearing um some cartilage in my shoulder i don't even know how um tearing my bicep tendon opening a window um you know it was assumed for so long that every thing that I told to a doctor that was really wrong was either psychiatric and I was exaggerating it or after I insisted on having an MRI because I was like, it really hurts like emergency style pain and I need you to take a look at it, was told like, well, you know, you probably should just, you know, you, you're probably lifting too much. And I'm like, lifting too much, what? <laughs> opening Water. a window, right? But yeah, I mean, it, it's, but that was very, like almost all of my symptoms for a very long time were attributed to my gender identity. So the, the trauma that people come to you with, and I'm sure that you all have trauma informed, you know, training lens, but the trauma that people come into those situations with is real, you know, having people sort of blame every symptom on their gender presentation um, or like some, or attribute like psychosis to someone's gender presentation when really like, you know, the person just hasn't been taken seriously and they're very anxious and they're trying to tell you what the problem is. And they're saying, you know, we got to call a psychiatrist in um, to talk about this. Um, that happens a lot. It happens in emergency rooms. It happens with, you know, primary doctors. It happens everywhere. It's really, really horrible. Yeah, all the, all the more reason that, that clear and trans-specific con ed is so vital, at the very least, to provide a baseline of affirming care and not cause more harm. I'm actually um, scheduled to interview uh, a surgeon who provides gender-affirming surgeries next week, and, and they're really awesome. They told me, uh, I had never heard this phrase before, but it makes sense, the trans-broken arm syndrome, where- Oh, I was just going to bring that up, yeah. yeah. Like, everything's attributed automatically to your identity, and that, that's true across the board, and that's something public health therapists also need to be aware of that someone who's trans is, can also have the same dysfunction of anyone who's cis, but just because they're trans is not necessarily the cause or the only factor to consider. Yes, usually yeah. has nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> I think with pelvic health, there's a little more implications, but I, I hear you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I, in general, yeah. there's no, but yeah, with public health, it, uh, with pelvic health, yeah. um, it can be different, especially if you're dealing with post-op folks, obviously. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, that kind of leads nicely into my last question. Um, you were super kind to share with me during our uh, consult before this interview that you've actually been a patient for pelvic floor PT. Um, would you mind sharing about your experience? Sure. Um, so when I, um, when I, so I'm a seahorse dad and when I gave birth to my first kiddo, um, it'll be nine years ago in October, um, it was just a really long, long labor. And, you know, I did not come out on the other side of that with, you know, reasonable bladder function. Um, and I just had a lot of pain. Um, and I, I had, um, some misalignment, which actually led to me needing a, a spine surgery. Um, I had some misalignment that occurred um, because it was, it was a pretty traumatic delivery, just sort of after being in labor for a very long time, they wound up having to use a vac vacuum um, because they realized that the cord was wrapped around his neck, which I know it is a lot of the time, but um, that's what happened. And um, I needed to go see a PT for my pelvic floor and I couldn't find anyone. And I was so petrified um, that I called a friend who's a PT who I had seen for other injuries al uh, along the years, who had, you know, kind of seen my whole transition, who became a really good friend. Um, and I know that this, she, she's a, um, a, a, an athletic, like foot orthopedic um, PT. Um, and I asked her to learn this so that she could help me. And she did. Um, because she knew, I mean, she first, she researched to see if she could find anyone and she called people and said that they know that they had never seen a trans patient. Um, and, you know, she, she suggested to me like, you know, maybe you want to try to pass as a cis person. And I didn't think I could, um, you know, going into that interaction. I just, you know, like, I, I didn't feel like I could lie or like, you know, put on like some kind of costume. Um, I felt like I needed someone who understood and I was, I was scared and I asked her to learn. Um, and she did, and she really helped me. 
Um, but you know what's interesting is that um, I will be completely honest because I always bring my full honest self to every space. Um, I have a physical tomorrow and one of my concerns is that some of that dysfunction has like returned a little bit and I don't want to ask my friend to do that again. And who am I going to see? You know, and what if it's something that, you know, sometimes you need a little minor, minor stitching to deal with bladder dysfunction. Sometimes you don't, you know, who, who am I going to see for that? And, and am I going to be okay? And it, the fact that it's still a concern, um, and I live in a diverse, you know, metropolitan area where I can't be the first trans guy who has given birth, who's had, you know, pelvic floor issues that, you know, are ongoing, um, that have, you know, gotten better with treatment, but, you know, now it's been a while. And I'm afraid to reinitiate that treatment because I don't want to ask that of my friend again. Um, you know, it's a lot. And there's new research that's come out, you know, and I'm going to ask her to do a whole new body of research. She's not, that's not her specialty. Um, and what if another doctor needs to be involved? Like, what do I do there? That seems really scary to me. Like, I don't know who I would see, what they would think, what assumptions they would make. Um, you know, there have been some really harmful assumptions made about my body by a lot of doctors. Um, and... I feel very uncomfortable seeking this type of care um, as a cis assumed person now, you know, cis male assumed person now, um, when it's not someone who I know. Yeah, it, well, first, it's amazing that your friend did that. Um, and I'm glad. So wonderful. That, yeah, that's wonderful. But it also is like that just speaks to how hard it is for folks to find people who do that kind of work and how it, it really should be in, integrated into like it's it's just standard that if you study pelvic floor you know how to care for someone who's pregnant and it should be integrated that we know how to care for someone who's trans or intersex or what have you and and even it's just so heartbreaking to hear the the thought of do I have to hide who I am and pretend to be cis and possibly expose myself to more more like medical trauma with the terminology they would use about you or the assumptions they would make about your body if you couldn't find a provider who was affirming and and that is really challenging I think that it's growing um, and there are more resources but like you said you're in a an urban area metropolitan area and and how folks who are in um, more rural spots are even less or even more underserved um, so so with, with all that in mind, um, well, thank you for your vulnerability, first of all, but with all that in mind, are there any, um, like one or two things that you think are like, the most important, if you, if you just had to give like one or two pieces of advice for pelvic health professionals, um, having been a patient, being so um, health literate as a healthcare provider yourself? Obviously dealing with pelvic health is very intimate. Um, my assumption is that they don't allow you all to specialize in this unless you have training and trauma-informed practices. Oh, you would think so. It's growing, but it's not, it's not. So a if that could be relevant. It should be a requirement. That could be relevant. That's not just relevant for trans people. That's relevant for anyone who's been, you know, a victim of any sort of abuse. Um, even non-sexual abuse can, can be, you know, it, any, any sort of, um, person who has body shame, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much um, trauma that people bring with them to any clinical space that, you know, going to a clinical space for parts of your body that you're taught to basically be ashamed of, which is absurd and something that our society needs to undo as a whole, but we're not there. Um, Trauma-informed care is exceptionally important and, you know, making sure that you understand your client's lived experience and making sure that when you're doing an intake with someone that you're, you're trying not to trigger their trauma. And if you do, you understand how to respond and that you know your intake forms screen for trauma so that you know if, you're, if your patient, you know, even though it's not relevant to their current file was you know, a victim of sexual assault you know, in the year 1998, like that could be, something really important for you to know, even though you don't want them to relive their trauma on a, on a form. I mean, it can be really, it can be triggering to list the trauma stuff on a form, but it's less triggering than having the, the interaction. 
um, because, or having to tell someone this triggers my trauma. Um, you know, so I think that having that as pushing for that as a requirement within your, your subfield is the single most important thing that I can say, because obviously, you know, all trans people are going to have different words for their, for their body parts. And every person has different words for their body parts. And, you know, trans people especially are going to feel, you know, very exposed when they're, you know, with someone because people equate body parts with gender. Um, and, you know, that's not always the case. And that might feel, you know, they might feel worried they're going to be invalidated, but, you know, all of that is very important. And it's very important to learn how to care for trans people in general on their terms, but making sure that you understand how to care for people who have had trauma is the intro to that. And so that's sort of like my, um, that's my, that's my nugget there is in making sure you understand trauma and how that can sort of interplay with a clinical interaction with anyone, not just a trans person is, is huge. I love that. I feel like trauma-informed care or especially um, sexual assault related trauma is just sprinkled in amongst Con Ed, but it's not, it's certainly not as common for it to be. It's its own standalone thing, much less a requirement, but you're exactly right. It, it helps um, improve the care for trans folks, but for cis, cis folks too, it helps everyone. Um, well, it sounds like there's some kids yelling outside. Sorry about that. Um, well, I just want to say thank you for your expertise, for your knowledge, for your time. Um, and if there's nothing else, that's all I have for you today. Uh, and that concludes our interview. Thank you so much for having me. I, you know, hope to be in contact. Sounds good. Okay, let me go ahead and.